Merry Christmas. Did y'all know that it's still Christmas? <laughs> Somebody earlier today was complaining about the fact that they already put their tree away and their husband wasn't too excited about the fact they already put their tree away. And I had to kind of help them understand that Christmas actually began at Christmas in the church here anyway and goes for another couple of weeks. So if you're one of those people who likes to leave your tree up for a really long time, there's good news. You have a couple more weeks of uh, sipping eggnog by the lit Christmas tree. Y'all ready to go today? You seem a little groggy. Is it the rain? Hard to get going today? You're not the only one. But the good news is, today we have one of my absolute favorite sections of Scripture. I'm so thankful that as we laid out the, the preaching schedule, that, that this was the reading schedule for today and that, and that I got it. So we're going to dig in in just a second to the reading you just heard from Colossians. But before we get there, I want to take you back to Christmas Eve for those of you who are here with us. At 11 o'clock on Christmas Eve, I kind of challenged us to, to think about what is our mental picture of Jesus? Is our mental picture a helpless little powerless bundle of, of babiness that can accomplish nothing? Because if that's our picture of Jesus, we miss out on the actual image of Christ. Or maybe you're not that way. Maybe you have no problem seeing grown-up Jesus, but you have transitioned that Jesus, in your mind, is your BFF. If you don't know what that means, by the way, ask the person next to you. They will take a second and explain it to you right now. But maybe, you, maybe you're one of those people that like, that, like, Jesus is your buddy. And if that's your mental picture of Jesus, you don't have a full biblical understanding of who Jesus is. Or maybe to you, Jesus is just the big marshmallowy teddy bear that you can snuggle with. Or maybe Jesus is, is, is some kind of stern disciplinarian. Or, or I don't know what your image of Jesus is. But today, before we roll into this Colossians text, we have to stop a second and ask a very fundamental question. Not only what is our mental picture of Jesus, but where does it come from? Where does your mental picture of Jesus come from? Is it just like driven by your emotions, how you feel in the moment? Like today it's rainy and it's wet and it's been rainy for far too long and it's glum and so you're kind of down and so that's, that's what drives your relationship with Jesus is how you feel in your gut. Or maybe your, your understanding of Jesus is derived by your experience. Something really good happened to you with a kid when you were a kid, and so you give all the credit to Jesus, and now you expect Jesus to give you all kinds of good stuff. Right? Today, before we go anywhere, I want to anchor us in a concept of Jesus that is not derived from our emotionalism or our experiences, but is actually derived from who Jesus really was as revealed to us in scripture and as proclaimed through the generations by the church. So I'm gonna throw some words up on the screen. Let's see if you recognize these. Anyone? I promise there are words. Those aren't them. Maybe I lied. There they are. Does anyone recognize these words? Anyone? I know you're all sleepy, but does anyone recognize these words? Okay, I was getting really worried. We were about to go into like confirmation class 101. These are the words of the Nicene Creed, specifically the second article of the Nicene Creed. The first article proclaims who God the Father is. The third article proclaims who the Holy Spirit is. And the middle, the second article, the largest of them, proclaim who Jesus was. Now here's why this is important, because this creed was written at around 300-ish, somewhere in that century. And it was written as a response to heresies in the church. False teachings. 
See, people felt all butterfly about Jesus, and so they thought that's who Jesus was. Or people tried to get all cognitive and understand who Jesus was in this purely intellectual way, disregarding how Jesus had revealed himself in the scripture. And so the church finally said, no, we got to set this straight. And so they put all these words up. I'm not done yet. Sorry. Give them back to me. Thank you. So in the second article of the Nicene Creed, we get all this language about Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, light of light, very God, begotten, right? We get all of these big words. Why? Because we want to make sure that our concept of Jesus is derived from Jesus Himself and from what God has revealed about Jesus in the Scriptures not about what we feel about Jesus or what we think about Jesus in any given moment. Now, here's why that's important. Grab your Bible, and we're going to go to this Colossians reading, Colossians chapter 3. Here's the setup. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church, and he has just finished a section where he is going to lay out what we just laid out in essence. He is going to challenge the church to reflect firmly upon the beliefs of the church rather than on their own emotionalism or their own intellectualism. In other words, he has just come out of a section of basically saying, don't be deceived, don't let people freak you out, don't let people pin you down by all this other stuff about Jesus of asceticism or their thoughts of their, their own personal visions rather than how God reveals himself in their, his word some other means that God maybe speaks to them directly, which, by the way, isn't biblical, but we can talk about that another day. But instead, Paul is challenging the church to say, no, don't be dissuaded or discouraged or, or, or misled by any of those kind of concepts about who Jesus is. Anchor yourself in who Jesus actually was. It's li in light of that, he says this, Colossians chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, and, and by the way, the implied answer there, or the implied response to that is you have been raised with Christ. So maybe we should just read it that way and take the rhetorical question out. Since you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. My favorite verse, by the way, in all of Scripture is verse 3. For you have died, and your life is now hidden in Christ, in, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. And then we get this whole paragraph of things you shouldn't do. Put to death, or kill is actually the literal translation. Kill what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, blah, 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 blah. And then we skip down to verse 12 and we get the, the good flip side of the coin. But, but instead, put on these things as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, right? You with me? So let's see if we can make some sense out of this. Paul has just finished teaching about not being misled. In fact, if you just skip back to chapter 2, verse 18, it says this, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions or personal revelations, um, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, which is Christ, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. So Paul has just finished kind of telling the church not to be discouraged, but to anchor themselves in truth. And then he rocks this Colossians 3 section that begins with talking about if you have been raised with Christ. You get the image right here? If you've been resurrected with Christ. And actually, if you read on in my favorite verse, Colossians 3, 3, you get these words for you died and so there's there's some very intentional imagery that paul is drawing on here you want to guess what it is it's baptism paul is taking us back to the baptismal font and he's very intentionally connecting this in contrast to how we feel or how we may be misled so Paul is saying, don't be misled by how you feel or how you think or what your experience is or what you might like about Jesus today or not like about Jesus today. No, 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 no. Anchor yourself in this, which is objective. 
This is when God did his work in your life. That's what this is. See, this is hard for us to grasp, I think. Because we're Lutherans and we do this really pretty piece of furniture with this little tiny bit of water. And, and, and we're sprinklers, right? We're sprinklers. So this imagery is lost on us because at no point in time when someone is baptized do we fear for their life. Do you? Like when you see us do the little dip on a baby, you don't go, he's going to drown the kid. But that is actually the historic image of what baptism is. It is probably way better illustrated by full immersion because the image there is that you go under the water and you die. You are drowned and then you are resurrected with Christ Jesus from the waters of baptism. It's really quite beautiful. We die to ourselves and we're resurrected with Christ Jesus out of the water. That's the image that Paul is going for here in Colossians 3 when he's going to talk about the fact that you have been raised and that you died with Christ. You follow? I want to be very clear. Because we're going to get real dicey here in a second. So I need to establish this firmly with you. God's grace is given to us because Jesus is who he is. Because we can proclaim that he was very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. Jesus is that, no matter how I feel about him today or not. No matter how you feel about him today or not. So I can rest in this moment in my life because in this moment, the Jesus who actually was, despite how I feel about him, came to me and placed the name of the triune God on me in this objective moment. And it's quite beautiful. And I didn't do anything to earn this. And neither did you. Right? 100% God's grace. We come before God broken and messed up and God puts his perfection on us. We don't clean ourselves up. We don't get pretty before God. No, we come a full-on train wreck, and God reclaims us. That's the beauty of baptism. Yeah? You all with me? Here's where it gets dicey. Here's where this reading is really hard for some of us. Because, see, I grew up in a church, a good Bible-teaching church that taught me all about this, about the fact that this is not of me, this is of Christ, and I own that fully. But they also took the next step and kind of passively taught me that, therefore, because it was all about Jesus, that nothing in my faith life was about me. And I know some of you were raised in that same church, not literally, but figuratively. And so I grew up with this concept that God's grace was given freely to me, and because God's grace had nothing to do with me, then therefore neither did the way that I live have anything to do with me. It must all be about Jesus and must be forgivable, and so I could do whatever the heck I wanted. So it's not about me anyway, right? And when I was weak, I would just say, well, God, you clearly didn't fix this in me yet. And I was like this passive passenger just riding along on the pathway of faith. This text is challenging for those of us who grew up with that kind of a belief system. That just because God's grace has nothing to do with this, it doesn't mean that our faith life, our walking with Jesus as a result of him claiming us in the waters of baptism, it doesn't mean that this doesn't have anything to do with us. You follow? Let me see if I can make it clear. God claims us and gives us the gift of faith, and then we live in faith by walking with Jesus and subjecting our lives to his rule as the eternal, forever, and all-powerful king of the universe. But we do this. We have to wrestle with the way we live and the choices we make and the, and the way we treat people. We have to do that. We don't get to pawn this off on God and, and flippantly assume that we can just live however we want because it doesn't matter. It, it does matter. Thus, Paul in this reading, I'm going to keep drawing you back to this. Paul in this reading begins with this baptismal imagery. But then he quickly shifts, having established your relationship with God is because of God in Christ Jesus. He shifts and starts telling us that we should set our minds on things that are above or 
the really challenging verse of verse 5. Put to death or kill, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Is putting something to death passive? Y'all understand the meaning of the word passive, right? Is putting something to death or killing something, is that passive? No, it's a very active process, right? For all of you who slaughter animals every fall while wearing bright orange clothing, <laughs> you can't do that passively. You can't, like, sit at home with a nice cup of coffee in the warmth of your house and assume that you're going to have venison. Right? You have to actively get up and, and rub like animal scent on you or whatever you hunters do. I don't know. I'm not a hunter. And put on orange clothes and go sit out on some tree for like four days straight in the cold complaining to everyone about how cold it is. And, and then you actually have to take the shot. It's an active process to kill something, to put something to death. Paul is challenging the church. You have the identity in Christ. That's what happened in your baptism. You have been given a new life in Christ. Now living out that new life in Christ is about actively putting to death that which is in you because of your sinfulness that is contrary to the new life you have in Christ. So you don't get to play the passive, I'm just like chilling in my pews card. No, you have to actively seek after that which is opposed to Christ and simultaneously, if you flip down a couple verses, seek after that which is consistent with your new identity in Christ and seek to develop this, the good stuff, and seek to put to death this, the bad stuff. That's what the life of faith is. That's what it means. That we have been baptized, therefore, we have to kill that in us which is contrary to our new identity. We're cruising into New Year's. I always love asking this question, so I'm going to. How many of you have made resolutions or will make resolutions? Just a few. Just a few that will admit it. A uh, couple things about resolutions. First of all, I think that you all are doing them wrong. Uh, so let me teach you how to do them right. Because inevitably, you make resolutions about this time of year, and about this time of year next week, you will all be telling me that you broke them, right? So your commitment was you want to work out more, and you know that's not going to happen. Your commitment is to watch more television or read more books or eat less chocolate or eat less fat or eat more fruits, right? Th those are your resolutions because that's what everyone makes. And then a week from now, you'll all be very sad because you stink at keeping resolutions. I think you're just making them wrong. So this year, just resolve to eat more chocolate, work out less, eat way more fatty protein and a whole lot less vegetables. Just set your resolutions at a realistic level. And then a week from now and a month from now and a year from now, you'll be like, I rock at keeping New Year's resolutions. <laughs> All right, maybe that's a bad idea. But what could be a good idea by way of resolutions is to look at what Paul says here and to spend the next week or so really reflecting on these words and praying through what does it mean to have a new identity in Christ Jesus that God gave me freely in the waters of baptism. And then how do I assess my life with honesty to look at who I am and my sinfulness, but to look at his righteousness and to desire this and to despise this, to seek after this and to put this to death. So maybe eating as much chocolate as you want is a bad resolution, but maybe resolving to reflect upon these words from the Apostle Paul, maybe that's a good way to approach a new year. Maybe it's a healthy thing to see this really as Paul driving us back to the waters of baptism and saying, this is who you are. Make no mistake. This is who you are. Now, you may not be living like it yet because you might still be crazy and you might still just be doing whatever you want and you may not have conformed your life to the desires of God, but this is who you are. So this 
New Year's? Maybe instead of celebrating New Year's, we should stop and celebrate the fact that in Christ, we are new creations. Because that's what God's word tells us. That's what God's word tells you about who you are. You are a new creation. Let's pray. Father, you are good. And your mercy endures forever. God, thanks for uh, giving us this day. Thanks for giving us rain that can serve as a reminder of our baptisms. Thanks for claiming us in the waters of baptism. Thanks for putting us to death and raising us to new life with you. God, you are so good, and yet we are so awful at seeking out and and questing after the, the death of that which is part of our earthly desire. Lord, help us by your spirit. Empower us to go on the hunt to kill that which is earthly in us, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. And likewise, God, I I ask that you empower us to then, in the midst of putting those things to death, to clothe ourselves, to put on as your chosen people, holy and beloved by you, God, that you would allow us to put on compassionate hearts and kindness and meekness and patience and humility Lord, as we roll into the new year, remind us that we are new creations because of you. That is who we are, and our goal, our desire is to live as new creations. Jesus, we love you, but not as much as you love us. We pray this in your name, and the people of God said, amen.